Hello students of science, in this video we're going to talk about the solution process. How you take something and dissolve it and factors that will affect it. Here's a really cool artistic display a guy made, they call it the salt dress. He took a dress, put it in the Dead Sea where there's a very high salt concentration, and over the course of months just kind of let the salt crystallize around it. Let's talk about how that can happen. So, some factors that will affect whether or not something's going to dissolve. Here's how you could increase it. You could increase the solute surface area. So let's say we have like a cube here. If you were to divide that into smaller cubes where the surface area is going to be increased, and even smaller cubes where the surface area is way higher there, these ones are going to dissolve faster than the one with a smaller surface area. 6 centimeters, 24 to 96. This one will dissolve fastest. The more finely divided a substance is, the faster it's going to dissolve. Here I have an example of three types of sodium chloride table salt, kosher salt, and sea salt. As you can see, sea salt has the largest crystals. Table salt is the most finely divided. From right to left, we are going to see sea salt will dissolve slowest compared to kosher salt, which will dissolve slower compared to table salt. You could also take your solution and agitate it, mix it, stir it, shake it up. I was like that Simpsons quote, you know, shake hot a boy, they're getting away. But anytime you're going to be mixing something up or shaking it, and this has been my long dream to somehow work this GIF into an educational format, you are having more solvent come into contact with more solute. That's going to increase the rate that it's going to be dissolving. You should also heat up your solvent. When you're doing this, basically you're going to get more solvent-solute collisions, and you're getting higher kinetic energy collisions between them, causing it to dissolve faster. All of those will cause it to go into solution a little bit quicker. Solubility is how well one substance will dissolve another. For every combination at a different temperature, there is a limit. So you can have a solution in one of three different states. You can have it to be saturated, unsaturated, or supersaturated. So in unsaturated, solute is still going to be disappearing, dissolving into it. Saturated, it's reached its limit. It's full. And then under rare circumstances, you can get supersaturated where the crystals are actually going to form out of the solution. So when you have saturated, that's going to contain the maximum amount of dissolved solute. The solution is at equilibrium, so you have an equal amount entering and leaving the solution at once. Here we have salt crystals, where those sodium chloride ions are going to be entering and leaving the crystal, the solid state, at the same rate there. So it's an equilibrium. And unsaturated, that's pretty easy. Anytime you have unsaturated, that's when it has less solute than a saturated solution. So up until the moment that it is saturated, we would still consider it to be unsaturated. So here I'm dissolving this thing in here, unsaturated, unsaturated. Once it's not changing, then we know that to be a saturated solution. And finally, supersaturated. That only exists under special conditions, and it is temporary until you disturb it. Here's some examples of supersaturated solution. When you put something in there, some sort of nucleation site, all of a sudden, all that stuff is going to crystallize out of the solution. It almost looks like the snowflake is growing there. A crystal is growing. Here's another one where if you put a nucleation site in there, like with a pencil or something like that, the crystals are going to grow off of that. My personal favorite, this dude putting his hand inside a uh, supersaturated solution, and the crystals are growing right off of it. We can measure solubility as the amount of a solute that forms a solution at a specific temperature. So here I have some different examples. What I want you to do is write down one example of something that is in solid and one example of solubility that is in a gas. One solid, one gas. Sugar is 204 grams per 100 grams of water at 20 degrees Celsius, or calcium hydroxide, 0.189 grams per 100 grams at 0 degrees Celsius. So notice that I'm including the temperature in there as well as the per 100 grams. Now you also notice that I have two things here that are gases. Gases are going to be a little bit different when you're writing it out. You have to include the pressure. And these are not at standard temperature and pressure because obviously the temperature is changing. We would call these at standard pressure, aka one atmosphere. So when you are talking about solubility, you need to make sure you are including the pressure. These two ones happen to be at standard pressure. I could have one at different solubility at two atmospheres or something like that. When you increase pressure, solubility changes. Make sure you are marking down that. Some guidelines for solubility. Anytime you have liquids that are going to be dissolving into each other, we would say that they are what is called miscible. So here I have a yellow and a blue liquid. They are mixing together here. We would say that these two liquids are going to be miscible with one another. Anytime you have two liquids that do not dissolve, that would be called, obviously, immiscible. 
A common example of this would be oil and water. One is hydrophobic, one is hydrophilic. They don't like to mix with each other, they are immiscible. You leave oil and water to sit long enough, they will separate like this. Here's another example, if you just drop the oil into it, it's gonna sort of not wanna mix, but it will still stain like these little balls, these little clumps. If you let it sit long enough, you can sometimes get some different layers form. If you're super creative and got a lot of time, you can get some different soluble dyes and get a really, really cool rainbow mixture there of least dense to highest density, but of course they don't want to mix with each other. The general idea is like dissolves like. Solvents and solutes are more likely to dissolve if they share chemical properties. Two things that are polar, like a polar compound and a polar solvent, are more likely to dissolve. If you have a nonpolar compound and a nonpolar solvent, they are likely to dissolve. It's like the old chemistry joke. we got three bears, a grizzly bear, a black bear, and a polar bear. Which one dissolves in water? Well, obviously it's the white one. It's polar. Get it? Water's polar. Okay. The joke's funny to me. I'm going to go with it. I just like this image. It's really cool where you can see two liquids that are, of course, immiscible, oil and water, and you can see really close how they don't want to mix with each other and they will not mix with each other. Gas solubility. When you increase the pressure, you increase the solubility of a gas. So you have like a piston and then there's a liquid in there. When you push down on the piston, you are going to be increasing pressure and that's going to be pushing more of that stuff into your liquid there. This is how they make that pressurized gas when it comes to like carbonated sodas. They have CO2 in the air, you put pressure on it, and that's going to get more of that carbon dioxide to dissolve inside the water. However, if you increase the temperature, that actually decreases the solubility. This is almost counterintuitive. Increasing temperature, less oxygen can actually dissolve into it. This is the opposite of what we've seen with solids. Usually increasing temperature will increase solubility. And this is the opposite of pressure. Increasing pressure obviously increases it. So this is counterintuitive and worth thinking about. When pressure goes up, solubility goes up for gas. But when temperature goes up, a gas solubility will actually go down. At colder temperatures, more gas can be held in solution. So Gases usually decrease with temperature, whereas solids and liquids do increase in temperature when it comes to solubility. When you have something go into solution, energy is either going to be taken in, that's called an endothermic reaction, or given off, an exothermic reaction. Sodium hydroxide and water, when you dissolve those two together, that's going to be exothermic. Other compounds will feel a little bit colder when they go into solution. Those are endothermic. To actually separate solute molecules from each other, that's going to take some amount of energy, and it might also give off energy. If it's going to give off more energy than it took, we would call that an exothermic reaction. If it's going to take in more energy than it took, that one is going to be an endothermic reaction. To take my salt molecule here and break it apart, energy is required, and it also might release energy with that afterward. Here we have the salt after dissolving. Every solution is either going to be classified as endothermic, heat goes in, or exothermic, heat goes out. By the way, fun little fact, all of my transitions here have been the dissolve transition because we were talking about solutions. Yeah, pretty cool.